All right, we are on. Margot Gear, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Thanks, Brad. I'm good. It's good to be here. Thanks for doing this. I mean, this has been uh, a long time coming for me. I think I've only sent you about uh, 35 text messages <laughs> trying to trying to hound you for an interview. And so, um, look, I, I appreciate you doing this now. Thank you. Yeah, looking forward Wh to it. Why? Um, well, I mean, all right, let, let, let's just start from the start. I want, I want to go to the start because this this is an, a really interesting interview for me because um, you've, you've had outstanding success at Alabama. So first of all, congratulations on the year that you've had. Thanks. <laughs> Come on, you can be more excited than that. You know it was a great year. You can feel proud about that. I can see the trophy in the background too, so you should be extremely Had proud about that. to get it out for you. <laughs> But um, how did this all come apart, uh, about, Margot? Like, t tell me, you know, you're a professional athlete, you know, about four months out of Olympic trials, you know, headed towards kind of another uh, run at maybe an Olympic Games. And then all of a sudden this announcement comes out that you're, you're retiring from swimming and you, you're going to take over the head coaching position in Alabama. I think it was a shock to everybody, just kind of the way it happened. Uh, it, was, it was just unexpected, I guess. So tell me... How did this come about for you? Well, just like any moment that seems like it's a, a big uh, breakthrough moment, I think there's probably a lot um, a lot going going on and leading up to that point. Uh, you know, coaching for me was something I always wanted to get into. Um, it maybe came as a shock to other people that um, that was something I wanted to do. But I think, you know, coaching has been something I've thought about for a long time, really since I was an athlete. Um, at University of Arizona. And so for many years, um, you know, as I was swimming professionally and as I was continuing my own uh, journey through the sport, I was also thinking about, um, you know, what I wanted to do uh, after that chapter was done. And um, coaching was really on my, on the forefront of what I wanted to do. And so, um, you know, working through you know, the pandemic and different things going on um, as you're training for an Olympic trials. Uh, the year in itself was crazy. There's a lot of things going on. And um, I think ultimately, you know, I I made a decision. I had a, a, an opportunity presented to me and um, made a decision to go all in on that coaching dream that I had. And, um, you know, like I said, I think comes to a shock, comes as a shock to a lot of people that um, that might not have known the situation going into it, but um, for me, it felt like uh, something I was, you know, I was, I was up for the challenge, I guess. Well, that, that's interesting. How was it presented to you? Because you're, you're a professional athlete, so how would anybody think at that point in time that they should present an opportunity for you? Like, how did that opportunity come about? What was the initial conversations? Um, I think, you know, uh, having relationships with different people throughout the university. Um, I've been in Tuscaloosa for three years. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, people, you know, people that I've talked to, people that are within the department, um, I had mentioned that coaching was something I wanted to get into eventually. Um, you know, I, I didn't know exactly when or what that would look like or where that would be, but um, I knew that down the road that was going to be my next step. So I think, um, you know, talking through with different people at the university, um, you know, mentioning that that would be something down the road that I'd want to do. And so, um, like I said, just an opportunity came up, um, you know, at a time that I couldn't really, um, couldn't, couldn't ever really dream of or predict, but, um, but it was something that I knew I wanted to go all in for. Now, from, from what I've heard, from what I've read, maybe you, you knew the athletic director formally. So you, you guys had had some, some crossover maybe at Arizona. Is that correct? Yeah, so Greg Burns, the athletic director here at, uh, at Alabama, and Greg was the AD um, when I was a student athlete mm. at University of Arizona, and um, I was a part of SAC, which is a, a student athlete advisory committee uh, on at the university, and uh, that's something that Greg was very heavily involved with. So um, about once a month, um, we would meet, and Greg was there, and I kind of formed a pretty good relationship with him. Um, throughout my four years at the university and then uh, kept in touch with him ever since and um, kind of, you know, ended up at Alabama by chance and he was here and, um, you know, kind of uh, came back full circle. Yeah, well, well, I'm glad those conversations started. Uh, that's pretty outstanding. But I will say this, 
there's kind of this split line and, I, and I'm going to be brutally honest with you. And, and I think you know this already, but there's, there's a line down the middle of people who think, you know, fantastic. She's got this opportunity. She's a female, she's leading men's and women's program. You know, it's a top 10 program in the country, like amazing. Right. And then there's the other side of it who are like, she's got no experience. She's never coached before. So, you know, so where, where were you on the line initially? Like, did you see both sides of this thing? Um, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot that goes into any decision in life. I think, uh, the great thing is that, um, you know, as, as everyone gets to decide their own decisions and make their own choices, I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, like the only person who's really living that out is me. And so, um, I think for me, ultimately it was deciding, you know, what was, what was best for me and what I really wanted to do and kind of, um, eliminating anything else that would get in the way of helping me to make that decision. So, um, yeah, I, I'd say, you know, there's a lot of things that make a great coach. And I think there's a lot of experiences that can make a great coach. I don't know if there's, um, there's one size fits all to be a great coach. You know, I think, uh, you know, looking back, it's 2022. I was talking with someone the other day. I mean, I've been around elite college programs since 2010, really, um, you know, being, being involved, whether it was, um, you know, as a student athlete or coaching at Ohio State or being around Alabama and programs like Indiana. So I've been around college sports and, and really within college swimming for 12 years. And, um, you know, granted, it wasn't always on the pool deck um, coaching, but it was very much involved with uh, what our sport look like, looks like, um, the ins and outs of that. And so in a lot of ways, I felt like I had this really unique experience and I see things through a very different lens than most people. And I kind of used that thought and that idea to carry me into uh, this next phase. Uh, look, you and I, in a way, have had similar paths. You know, I went from, you know, being a professional athlete into kind of the, the coaching ranks and very quickly became a head coach within a couple of years due to cert certain circumstances. Um, but uh, but uh, it's it's not as fast as the way you transitioned. I mean, you transitioned from athlete to head coach immediately. So wh why that transition? Why not go into kind of an assistant role, a lead assistant role, whatever it is, and, and kind of get your feet wet there? How did you feel like you could just transition straight into the head coaching role? Because for me, that would scare the crap out of me. I don't know what it did for you, but tell me. Well, uh I kind of, I, I guess, kind of put it back to you kind of understand this. I mean, how similar is the assistant role to the head coach role? Um, there's a pretty big difference there. And so mm -hmm. even if you go, you know, even if you're going to go into an assistant coach role, yes, absolutely. You're going to find things that you're going to learn and, and sharpen skill sets and things like that. But I do think the head coach role is something pretty different. And so, um, you know, I think, whatever path, like whatever path's going to get you there. Um, I felt like I was equipped and ready to handle that. I felt like, um, you know, just like anybody, there's going to be things that challenge me and push me and, um, you know, that I'm going to have to get better at. But I do feel like uh, the head coach role of, you know, managing people and, and um, you know, working through um, the bigger picture and things like that. I felt like that's something that, um, that I excel at. Ma managing people is, is a great way to say because a lot of people hear head coach and they think that you're just coaching kids to swim fast and it's it's way beyond that it is a, a management role i mean you're, you've got a staff of people that you're managing you've, you've got a, a college team you may even have some professional athletes so i mean you've got an array of different people that you're managing and then you know within that you've got to work within the athletic department to to um be part of that group so that there's so much involved in it um it's an incredible step uh were there anybody that you leaned on to to make this decision like your you know former coaches anybody in your inner circle maybe your parents friends anybody that you kind of like went to and said you know should i do this is this something i could do or or is this was this just an internal decision I think ultimately it was an internal decision. Um, I think that's one thing, you know, being a professional athlete and spending so much time um, working through like a 
on my craft and on my, you know, on my goals as a professional athlete, um, making the choice, you know, and, and really um, following through with something that I want to do. I, I, you know, I did talk with people, um, you know, Frank Bush, Rick DeMont, people from back in, um, back at mm -hmm. Arizona, um, you know, my parents, my brother, uh, people that are kind of removed, not so much within the sport, um, but know me and know what I'm about and, and who I am and, and what I want to do down the road. So yeah, definitely talked with people, got some different, you know, thoughts, ideas, but ultimately, um, yeah, went with my heart, went with something that, um, that ultimately was my choice and, and my decision. Good. Well, I'm glad you made it. So listen, let's move on from that then. So you, you made the decision, you're now the head coach. What are some of the first things you do? What, what, are, what are some of the first things you feel like you need to do? And this is kind of a question for anybody that may be transitioning into a, a situation like that. They can learn from you. So what were the, the first points of attack where you're like, I've got to handle these things first? I think my first thought was really being uh, extremely patient and thoughtful and intentional with everything we were doing. So I came in uh, kind of in the middle of a season, so which is pretty unique and rare in its, in its own way. And so uh, being very mindful of that and then um, kind of observing, taking time and just being diligent with, um, you know, seeing the, like I said before, seeing the bigger picture of, of what we're doing and where we want to go. And so that's kind of what the approach I took last season and kind of going through the summer. And then this fall had, um, you know, made lists and different things and different ideas that we wanted to implement this year and um, kind of attack those one at a time and, and not try to do too many things at once and really focus on, you know, one or two things that, that we think are very important as a staff and then go from there and, and have like more of a long-term approach and, and really, um, like I said, just taking it one or two things at a time and working with the kids and making them realize that um, everything we're doing is about the program and, and trying to set them up in the best way possible for, um, you know, their their academics and their athletics. Yeah, I want to give some props to a, a good friend of mine, Ozzy Covado. Ozzy was kind of the the head coach um, in in waiting, you know, not, not in waiting, but in, in kind of like waiting for you to come on board, right? So he was kind of there as somebody that was kind of steering the ship while you were making that transition and then eventually taking over a few months later. So how, how did, how did that relationship work? And, and then, you know, how does it work now? Well, first and foremost, Ozzy is incredible. Um, he's someone that uh, that's really been just instrumental in everything that, that the program has been able to do, but also for me personally and, um, and professionally, like he's, He's really um, just been extremely helpful. And so last season, uh, he, like you said, he was steering the ship and, and keeping things going. And we were really co-coaching at that point um, and leading the charge. And then this season, um, he's been just the person that uh, has been, you know, keeping things uh, high energy, keeping things uh, just light and fun and enjoyable. And I think that's something he does um better than most people is, you know, through challenging times or times that seem, um, you know, very high pressure or stressful, uh, he finds ways to make it light and fun and, um, you know, just really enjoys what he's doing and loves what he's doing. And so that's contagious. And I think as a staff, that's something we all uh, talk about and, and that's how we operate is just uh, loving what we're doing, being around one another, enjoying uh, the day to day and the, the, you know, the climb, the, the climb to what we want to do. We individualize training in the pool, so why not individualize your nutrition? Erica Barney of Barney Wellness Building will help you and your swimmers get exactly what each athlete needs through genetic testing and personalized nutrition plans. So stop guessing what you should and shouldn't be putting into your body. Athletes within a few weeks have noticed they're recovering faster because they're fueling their body with what they need and staying away from what their body hates. Erica understands swimming. She gets it. She's worked with over 20 Olympians, including the fastest man in the world, Caleb Dressel. Group discounts are available. So go to Biney Wellness Building and get in touch with Erica today. That's Biney, B-E-I-N-E, wellnessbuilding.net. You have to put a staff around you as well as Aussie. So how, how did you go about selecting the people that you decided to keep in your group? Because it's going to be very important for you moving forward 
to have a group that's united. So in terms of, you know, again, just learning from you and how you decided to select staff, what were some of the things you were looking for? Uh, really looking for, you know, a, a, a mix of people. I think one thing we talk about a lot with our team and with our recruits is that our staff has a lot of different personalities going on and there's a lot of, um, there's, there's kind of a style for everybody. And as the head coach, that's something that I, that I want. Uh, I want to have different sorts of people and styles and so that you know it can mix and match with different people on the team because our team is not made up of the same personality so uh for me it was important to have uh you know a fun group of people that i get along with um on the pool deck and and enjoy being around but then also um you know people who bring you know different things to the table in terms of background and um you know where they are in their in their journey through the sport so obviously ozzy's been coaching for, um, for longer, um, James Barber, who's been here for, for many years. And then we've got people like Reed and Roman who are uh, younger and, and have been around some really, you know, great programs and bring a lot of background from high level, um, you know, men's and women's programs too. So I think, like you said, you know, the staff that you, that you're surrounded by is really important. I know that, um, you know, I, that's something that I've, that I've picked up on from head coaches throughout the years is, uh, you know, who you have around you is so important and, and that really affects the the day to day. And I wanted to make sure I had that and I feel extremely good about that. I feel like we've got a staff that that uh, works together and really wants what's best for the kids and, and puts them first. Mm. I, I got two main questions on team itself, one, one as a whole. So the first question would be, how, how did you address the team as a whole? Like what, what were your, what was your message to the total group moving forward about how they would now embrace you and, and trust you as the head coach? What were some of the things that you were kind of telling the team? I think the first thing I said about trust and those things was that I know that trust is earned, not given. And so it takes time. And I think, again, like the approach was always to be patient and mindful of the situation that we're in because every program's in a different spot. And so for us, um, just being aware of where we were at and, and where we wanted to go and just being, um, being patient with that. So, you know, trust is, trust takes time, uh, trust takes experiences, trust takes uh, going through hard times together. And so last spring and summer uh, was definitely a phase of just building that trust and and building the trust in a way that um, was something we were going to be able to stand on this year. And I felt like this year that was a huge part of our success was that, um, you know, there was a lot of trust within the team, within the staff, within the program. And, um, you know, that's something we you have to have if you want to succeed um, from coach to coach. And then coach to swimmer and swimmer to swimmer. I mean, trust is uh, a building block, right? That, that's interesting though, because a lot of people would criticize this generation of, of people at young, younger, younger kids to say, well, there's not a lot of patience and they're not really um, wanting to go through hard times necessarily, you know? So that, that's a difficult sell as well to say, Hey, be patient in a, in a, in a world where, um, you know, everything's instant for them, you know, the, mm -hmm the whole world's coming at them instantly. And so they want instant gratification in, in a way so that, that, that can be difficult to sell that message, right? Yeah, I think so. And I think the best way to do that is to give personal experience and tell stories and share things that, um, that we've all gone through. And, uh, there's, there's countless stories that, that I can share about, um, different experiences and, and those things. And I think, um, the more, you know, we talk about how, you know, kids don't have patience or the team and things like that, but also coaches have to have patience. So we have mm -hmm. to have extreme patience. And I think uh, sometimes we, um, you know, we kind of move past that and we talk about the kids, but I think coaches have to realize that that's also on us and um, we have to adapt and figure out ways to work with, work with this generation and, um, you know, talk through, talk through more. And I think more time spent with them outside of the pool is also a big piece of that. And, that's something that um, that we found has been really helpful is, you know, taking time in those different pockets throughout the day that are not just at the pool, but, you know, coming into the office and chatting about other things, um, you know, going to the dining hall and sitting with them and talking with them at lunch and 
finding different ways and different um, spots to get to know them more. I think um, that's where it does take time. But if you you're really intentional with that, I've, I I feel like it can um, it can be really powerful. Cool. Now, the second major point that I kind of wanted to bring up here is that, look, that there's a lot of females leading female programs. There's not a lot of females leading male programs. You're, you're kind of one of the outliers and, and one of the trailblazers and, and doing it very successfully in your first year, by the way. But how did you get the men to buy in? What, what was your relationship with the men's team as a, as a female head coach now leading, you know, Division One men's program? I didn't think of it too much in that way. I just, I do, I think of it as two, you know, very different teams, but both working towards the same, the same goal. And we're both climbing in the same way. And I think um, your tone and like style and the way you address them is maybe a little bit different, but a lot of our meetings and things were combined. And so we're talking as one team. I do think um, at different points throughout the season, we did split up and talk more directly with the men about, you know, their focus and their goals, which is, you know, going to be just a little different than the women. Um, but allow that's what's where I feel like allowing, um, allowing your assistants to help out and to share things too is really big. Um, you know, I think my experience on the national team and being around some really high level, you know, males every single day uh, for many years, you know, working with Matt Grievers every single day, I, you know, I, I learned how to interact with them, how to, um, you know, talk and joke and, and, you know, really be able to communicate effectively with them. And so I don't feel like that's been necessarily any other, you know, that's been any bigger challenge than working with the women's team, to be honest with you. I think uh, both present their, um, present some challenges, but I think overall the men's team has been really enjoyable to work with and they've, um, you know, they've been pretty receptive and I think <clears throat> I don't see I don't see uh, too much you know between I was talking to uh, Katie Robinson about this uh, she's at Northwestern and and um, you know working with the men's team is something I, I really enjoy to be honest with you um, and and I think over time you know the the combined program feel is something that I was really looking forward to because um, working with men and women uh, is, is pretty special. And I think the energy that that creates when that's going really well is, is uh, hard to match. The, uh, I got so many questions from all that, so, but I'll, I'll jump into this one initially. So the, the differences between the, the, the women's meet at NCAAs and the men's meet is, is noticeable, right? Like it, it's different. So how do you as a female um, lead the women's NCAAs and then transition a couple of days later into the men's, you know, I had to, you know, change personalities in a way, kind of shift a little bit and do some things differently. What are you doing differently between those two major meets? I think, you know, looking at what the messaging was and kind of what the goals were the whole season and making sure um, you know, after the women's meet finished, just really reflecting and taking some time to, to um, you know, recognize what went well and, and you know, be proud of the, the success we had at that meet. But then almost like turning a page and really getting focused in on the men's meet, because I think, uh, you know, we did have a great women's meet and it was it was incredible. It was a, a, a huge success for our program. But then it was almost like got to turn this page and be ready for the men mm. <clears throat> and give them every single thing that they need and give them our, you know, all of our focus and energy. And because um, their seasons, you know, for them, their week was just starting. So um, definitely turning a page and getting ready into to get into the men's meet. I think, like you said, you do have to shift your tone and um, shift your message. But I think <clears throat> that's not any different than what we would do at practice <clears throat> or, you know, what we would do week to week to get ready mm. for the men or the women's um, meetings and things like that. Right. Yeah. Sorry. I jumped forward a little bit there. Sometimes questions come to me or thoughts come to me and I jump, I jump way too far forward, but uh, just going back then, how, how did you, how do you divide responsibility amongst your staff because it's very difficult you know i imagine you've got something like 30 men and 30 women on your team you, like i said you may even have some professional athletes that are kind of around the program so you've, you've got a lot of people and everybody wants a piece of margot everybody wants to say 
the head coach has some influence on me for sure. I mean, that's why they're at the program and that's why you're the head coach. So, but it, it's extremely difficult to have a lot of influence on that many people and, and be connected to that many people all at once. I mean, just, just imagine spending one minute um, a day with each person. It's almost impossible with, with 60 people, you know, it, it becomes really difficult. So how, how do you manage kind of breaking up the staff and the responsibilities for each person? So we, we work through primary groups. So there's, um, <clears throat> we have different primary groups and I share a primary group with Roman, uh, Roman Willits, one of my assistants. And so we have these different primary groups and, and really each coach is kind of in charge of that group and making sure that we're staying on top of everything that they need, um, checking out things, you know, from the school side of things, um, you know, the medical side of things and, and athletically too. And, um, so the primary groups are mainly how we operate and then we'll, um, we'll overlap on some days throughout the week with specialty groups. So I, I get to see, um, some different athletes through that. And then, uh, like I was saying earlier, I think just finding pockets throughout the day, um, to get to, to see every single person on the team, you know, we, we do an activation at the very beginning of practice with the entire team. And so at that point, like, you know, being there for that, making sure, you know, going and saying uh, hello and how are you doing to, to most everybody on the team and really getting in front of them and um, just spending as much time as, as I can uh, up front with them before the practice starts. And then, mm. uh, you know, afterwards too, just, you know, asking how practice went, how did it go? How's the week? What's going on? You have any tests coming up? And uh, just, just being, uh, being genuine and authentic through that, I think, is is better than spending so much time where, you know, maybe there's not a ton of deep conversation going on. So um, just making the most and optimizing the time that I do see them. What about communication with your staff? Like, how, how do you how do you guys communicate um, on, on a daily kind of weekly basis? Do you have like one ma major meeting together and and, and how do you communicate on a daily basis in terms of, you know, th things that are, there's always something going on, right? There's always problems that are arising. There's always someone's got this issue, this issue or that issue. And it's like, you, you, you got to keep a handle on so many different things. So how do you manage communication? So, yes, yeah, uh, weekly staff meetings throughout the year, for sure. Uh, I'm not, I try not to, I try I think time's really valuable, so I try try to be pretty direct and and concise with what we're trying to do. Um, so weekly staff meetings, but then also if there's you know smaller things going on throughout the week or day, uh, we've got a group chat that we're constantly talking in. Uh, you know that can get pretty funny too. Uh, just just uh, <laughs> trying to keep things light, but. Uh, yeah, so throughout the week, we've got that. And then definitely on deck, we're talking a lot um, before practice, after practice, checking in on certain certain kids uh, throughout the day. And, you know, I think the more time we spend together, the more uh, we realize that how important that piece is, that, um, that we got to talk with one another and let people know what's going on. And I think um, that can that can be a really difficult thing with a staff, especially with a combined program with a lot of people. But um, trying to be, you know, kind of more consistent with communication. And like I said, yeah, once a week, usually a bigger staff meeting. And then day to day, we're talking all the time. Mm -hmm. You've got some major challenges at Alabama. And, and this, is, this is something that I know personally. And, and I can kind of, um, you know, talk to you about the challenges that I faced because I was just uh, down the road facing the same challenges at one point. But uh, you, you don't have a, a huge in-state you know, pull to drag, you know, recruit from. So look, there's not a lot of in-state kids, if, if any, to be honest. Um, and, and then you don't have a lottery, you know, like a, like a Georgia has a lottery where they can kind of, um, you know, put, put some money in towards scholarships and things like that, that kind of aid that you don't have any of that. So, so some major challenges are scholarship that, that you're going to have to put into. And then, in-state you know the in the in-state value of, of school is a lot less than it would be for out of state so you you have to recruit out of state you don't have that lottery to help you kind of supplement some of those scholarships so that they're, they're two major issues H have you felt like that that they're really big um challenges for you as well i think you know you're right about different uh different parts of that i think one thing we've focused on with recruiting is um, really splitting it up 
uh, amongst the staff and, and really trying to use all of our firepower on that. Um, cause we do know that, you know, who you bring in is the most important thing for the program and that's your, that's your lifeblood. So we've got, um, you've got a lot of energy and time going into that. I do think, you know, international recruiting is really big, mm. um, big mm. for us. And I think that's, that's always going to be the case, um, to, to utilize that. But then, but then also, you know, domestically there's, there's all sorts of, um, all sorts of advantages to being at the University of Alabama that that we feel good to share, and um, I don't I don't know if I've thought too much about how hard that's going to be. I think I've thought more about just how exciting it is to share that story with them and where we're going and what we want to do, and um, you know, scholarships and and numbers and dicing all that up um, is uh, is an interesting part of the job. But I think ultimately just trying to get. Um, our message and our story out there and then trying to get the right kids here and focusing more on that versus what we don't have. All right. So then tell me what, what's the message and story? Cause you got, look, <laughs> there's not kids lining up to come to school to, to live in Alabama. Let's be honest. Like it, it's difficult, right? And, and, and because you're up against other programs and, and we all know what the other programs are. I don't even want to mention them right now, but the difficulty is to say, Hey, Alabama is a great school. Alabama is a great state to live in. I, look, I've faced this myself, so I know the problem. But it is, but once you get them on campus, then they see like, oh wow, this is an incredible school. Like it's a it's a great place to live. But but what's the story? How do you get athletes to at least come and look at you? I think a big piece of what we talk about is community for us. Uh, the athletic community at the University of Alabama is second to none. I feel like the sports that we have here, the the overall uh, commitment to being to be in the best and the resources we have, the facilities and all those things, but also just the community of people. Mm. And so we talk about that a lot and it's not just uh, the coach, you know, the swim, swim and dive coaches. It's not just, um, you know, our medical staff and things like that, but it's also, there's so many different pieces to being a student athlete. And so uh, we try to, to really dive into every single piece, um, you know, nutrition, strength and conditioning, academics, um, the med staff, uh, you know, our coaching staff. So giving them every single piece of information so they do know about all those things, because sometimes, um, you know, we do get overlooked. But I think the the athletic community that we have is, is second to none. Um, you know, academically, we've got a lot to offer. And I think that's something that um, we've become more and more comfortable sharing and like getting out there and making sure we're doing um, as much as we can to let people know about that. And I think, uh, you know, of course, we're always going to be up against uh, different different regions throughout the country that um, that may seem more appealing to certain kids. But I do think there there's a lot of uh, good here. And, you know, the the small town, the small college town feel is is uh, is something that I love. And uh, I talk about all the time, you know, there's not a lot of distractions for, for um, you know, getting a great education and for taking your athletics to the next level. Um, you know, there's things to do. There's wonderful, um, wonderful things here. But I think in terms of that big city feel and, and um, being somewhere that's got, you know, a, a crazy nightlife and different things like that, we don't have that. And so there is a lot of, um, there's, a, there's that piece of being able to just focus in on what you want to do and what you need to do for four years. Swim Angelfish. Swim Angelfish is an online certification program that strengthens your teaching curriculum to serve swimmers of all abilities. Swim Angelfish will prepare you and your instructors with the skills to teach swimmers with autism, physical disabilities, anxiety, sensory and motor conditions, and more. Learn to teach skills faster and with more comfort with Swim Angelfish. Apply for an only alpha pool product scholarship and receive up to 50% off your certification. Go to swimangelfish.com today to apply. Well, you've also got one of the most dominant programs in the history of college sports there and one of the most dominant head coaches in, in all of sports in Nick Saban, who I think is just um, one of the all-time greats and an incredible coach and leader and, and somebody that I really spend a lot of time listening to and studying i think he's he's done a fantastic job so it must be nice to have that resource there have you have you met nick have you been able to tap into any of that um kind of you know good good stuff coming your way to the swim program at all yeah 
And Nick's Nick's an incredible coach, and obviously a, a legendary individual, and uh, all that he does. And he's, I mean, we're steps away from their practice field. So mm. um, Nick came and spoke to the team last spring uh, before NCAA's, and uh, gave us a great message. And um, you know, Nick's just one of many great coaches on our campus, mm -hmm. and I know he's an all time all time great. But we've also got a lot of all time greats, and that was one thing when I when I stepped into this position uh, immediately. Every single coach from from you know gymnastics to tennis to mm. golf uh, to softball, you know every single coach head coach reached out to me and offered you know a hand for anything I would need and and really came uh, you know came came to the pool and said hello and talked to the team and really really did a lot of great stuff for us. So uh, mm. Nick obviously is uh, second to none, but. Uh, the whole, like I said, the community of coaches and athletics here is uh, is really special and something that I, you know, I really am grateful for and and think about all the time. Just how awesome this is that I'm a part of that, and um, you know, I I try to give back the best that I can too because I do. I get a lot from them. A lot of questions coming up just in my head as as we talk here. But um, one of the things I know about Alabama is there's been talk of kind of like an outdoor pool, new facility type situation, maybe an indoor pool. I'm not sure. But you, tell me, is there is there any um, realistic kind of plans for any new facilities for swimming at all? So we've got we've got a renovated pool right now. Um, the indoor 50 meter pool is is great. Um, they added a lot of different things to it, and then we've got an outdoor sh uh, outdoor pool right now that's short course yards and can go short course meters. So I don't I wouldn't say there's too much talks of it. I think um, we've got pretty much everything we need right now. But um, but a 50 meter outdoor would be really nice. Yeah, I've, always. So <laughs> we'll keep pushing that right now. You're getting good results. You're getting those trophies in the back. So once you start getting those, uh, you got to keep pushing. Um, you did have incredible results. I mean, your SEC championship, your women finished third. You weren't that far from second and 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 maybe even from from winning the whole thing. Um, your, your men tied for second, which was outstanding. I mean, it's a very competitive conference. So just in terms of SEC, talk to me about the, the team approach. You know, obviously you had to make some decisions early in terms of what you wanted to do at that meet. It wasn't it wasn't two weeks out, you decided, hey, we're gonna take a run at this. Like you you're deciding early. So how, how did you formulate the plan to have a successful SECs? So, yeah, that started back in back in the very beginning. I think we knew we wanted to, to first of all, go to a mid-season invite um, that was competitive and that uh, you, we could get up and get some fast racing. So in November, you know, we had a great invite, and I think that was really the start for us. And, um, you know, we had some kids that, that were really, you know, coming off of that meet, just really excited for SECs because they knew that they had already had some great results and that SECs is going to be even better. So, in terms of team goals and different things, uh, everything we focused on for SECs was just about being the absolute best we could be. It wasn't really focused on a ranking or you know a placing necessarily. I think um, that that really helped us in our approach because then coming off of SECs, we we had more even more to give after that. And I think, you know, for for February and then to get back up and get ready for March, I think obviously that's a that's a lot physically, but I think mentally to 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 come back and and be even better at NCAAs, um, that's where that's where the elite teams come out to be able to be really good at both. And that was our that was our focus, you know, be be great at SECs and and really um, challenge ourselves to to be for it to be a total team effort and for everyone to step up. We had you know a lot of newcomers, um, a lot of especially on the men's side, we had a lot of newcomers coming in and wanted to challenge ourselves there. And then coming back to at NCAA's, you know, just a couple of weeks later, and and everything we talked about was just being better and giving a little bit more and finding a way to give just a little bit more. And uh, I think that approach went really well for us this season. And I think you got to take every season, um, you, you got to approach each season as its own. And for us this year, that worked really well. And I think we'll go back and see what we need to do, you know, better for next year. This is kind of a hot topic right, right now, especially the last few years. Australia has gone to a system where it's more like the US, you know, the trials are kind of like a month before the world champs or Olympics. You know, you, you have your US trials coming up, which is, about five, five or six weeks or so, I think, you know, maybe maybe four weeks before the 
for the the U.S. Tri- uh, World Championships. So th- this is kind of something that you guys have to figure out, right? You you have your invite where you want to swim well, and then you have your SECs where you want to perform great, and then you have your NCAA. So the 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 timing of of rest and the timing of taper and figuring out how to swim faster at the bigger meets when it when it counts the most is a huge topic amongst amongst coaches right now so how did you guys discuss this and what were decisions you made how did you figure out how to swim faster at ncaa's because obviously your women especially you know they end up finishing fourth but they had they had a great secs too so that double taper kind of periodization thing is a, is a huge topic right now in, in swim coaching yeah and if anything i think we're finding that kids are going to adapt to to that whatever we're whatever our goals are i think that's really what we're like they're going to adapt so if we're if we're focusing on going fast at both i just think um you know for us secs like i said we were we were the goal was to go fast. That was the goal and to be a total team effort. So we definitely came down and, and got ready and got sharp for that. And then like when you, you know, when you say that, like, do you, do you mean a full taper? Was it like all in type thing? I think for, you know, for the majority of our team, you know, looking at how fast it was to get invited to NCAAs, I think, yeah, that, that was the case for most kids. You know, we were, we were talking about, you know, going to SECs and trying to get invited to NCAAs and, and, most kids need a full rest for that. I don't know many who, especially on the men's side right now, I don't know many who could have got invited without that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think most of them uh, were definitely fully, fully ready to go for that. And then I think, you know, coming back and getting right back into work for a good week and a half, two weeks, and then, you know, shortening that rest cycle going into going into NCAAs. But and, and physically, I think um, there's so many ways you can slice it and talk about it, but I, I do. I think um, the messaging and the mentality of that is so important and, and how you approach, you know, your day-to-day after SECs. You know, if, if you, we talked about like everyone had a great meet at SECs, but there was no one who had a perfect meet and there was no one who came out of that and said, hey, that's all I've got. And so talking about that every day, going into NCAAs, talking about how we're going to be better and really focusing on that message. I think that's a big part of championship season. So yeah, the, 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 you know, the physiology part of, you know, breaking it down and tapering and all those things. um, I think that's really important. And I think we did do a really good job of that, but I think more than anything, it was talking with the kids every single day about um, what we wanted to do in, in March. For, for those on the outside looking in, they don't really understand the the dramatic changes that happen between SECs and NCAAs. I mean, the the women are a week earlier for starters, so you got to you got to prepare them to to be ready at their best a week earlier than the men. And, or or on the flip side of that, you got to push the men out an extra week so that there's challenges with that. But then you lose a, a ton of your your team as well. So like there's there's kids that don't get invited. So all of a sudden it goes from, you know, thirty athletes preparing for an SEC championships to maybe uh, ten to twelve athletes really preparing for an NCAA's. And then the women have to focus on their own meet. The men have to focus on their own meet. So there's a lot of things going on. Swimmers over here not swimming. Swimmers over here focusing here. Men, women, blah blah blah. So it's it's a real mess of the head for coaches so from the moment sec finishes what are you guys doing as a staff to figure this out well right after secs we're kind of looking back at the results and seeing uh where kids are you know in terms of being invited i think that's a that's a big question mark because secs is you know a little earlier and so there's other meets still happening and going on so we're Mm. we're kind of getting right back into things and keeping most everyone who had it who had a shot uh, who were, who was, you know, relatively close. We, they were right back in the water getting into things. And the ones and, who aren't are doing what? Uh, they were getting some time, time off. So, mm-hmm. yep, they took a break and, and, uh, and kind of shifted their focus. And I think as a staff, you know, like you were saying, there's a lot of different moving parts going on mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. making sure that every single staff member has a pulse on what their primary group's doing and then talking that through. <clears throat> and I think that's where a lot of things can 
can uh, go, you know, kind of get through the cracks a little if, if you're not careful. But I think we had a pretty good approach on that. And um, if you if you look at the the numbers, you know, coming off of FCC is usually you still have to wait for, you know, a couple of weeks or so. Uh, and so we were getting ready for kids who needed to go to last chance meets to race again uh, and then getting kids ready who had clearly made the meet, just getting them ready and getting back in back into things. Mm. Um, so many things from that. I mean, you, you, you gloss over that, like it's super easy and you, and it's very, very difficult. I mean, you have kids who are also realistically going into party mode, you know, they're switching off. They're like, all right, my season's over. I'm going to go and have some fun as a college kid. I mean, they're in college, you know? So it's like, so how did you address the, the kids that want to go and have a good time now? Cause they've been working all year. And then the kids that are super serious of like i want to be at my best that there's a there's a clear division between the two so as a head coach how do you address that i think that's something that's more or less addressed throughout the whole year in terms of just respecting everybody and like respecting each other's goals and that you know every single person has different things that they want to accomplish individually and then as a team we have things we want to accomplish and so I don't know if we necessarily talked specifically about that, like, you know, um, for them to, to be mindful of, uh, you know, what our, what our NCAA qualifiers are doing. I almost feel like they understood that. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, at the end of the day, that that's a huge, that's a huge win if your team can acknowledge that and respect that. And again, not to say that it was perfect. I'm sure there's things um, that, that could be, better through that. But I do think overall our team was, was very respectful of, uh, of what our qualifiers were trying to do. And, and they know that that's a really big, I mean, that's, that's, that's the climb. Like that's the important part right there is getting to get into March and, you know, being, being extremely um, appreciative of how, how much time and energy that takes. And then knowing that um, we need to limit all distractions going into that. Yeah, that's interesting because it brings up a good point because I, I saw an interview with you when you kind of just were named the head coach where you talked about culture. And a lot of head coaches, when they first come in, they, they talk about setting the culture and changing the culture or what, it, you know, culture is kind of the buzzword. Um, so so what, what, what is the culture for you? How, how do you set it? How do you define it? What, what were some of the things you felt like you needed to address as, as culture? Yeah, you're right. Culture is a word used all the time. So I'm going to try not to say it too much as I'm talking about it. <laughs> I think it's just how your team operates and, you know, what you believe in and, and what you're doing day to day. And um, for us, it's, you know, being great. Uh, something Saban talks about, you know, life is short and you have, you know, you don't have unlimited time. So whatever you choose to do, go all in and be great at it. And that's probably the number one thing I think about every single day is that life is short and, you know, we have limited time and I don't, whatever I'm giving my time and energy to, um, I want it to be for the better. I want it to be, uh, for, for, you know, something that is my best. And I think that's what I talk with the team a lot about is you're choosing to do this. This is something that is special that not everyone gets, gets to do and let's be great at it. So being great at, at what we're doing, at what you choose to do, you choose to be a part of the team at the University of Alabama Swim and Dive, let's be great. So being great at what we do, and that's for everything. Um, and then we talk about celebrating competition. So for us, competing is, is you know, it's what we do every single day, compete. Uh, something growing up that, that my parents were both coaches and teachers. And when I was growing up, uh, my dad, he's a gym teacher. And so in gym class, uh, he would always, you know, be somewhat frustrated with athletes in, in middle school that didn't want to really like compete in gym class because they thought they were too cool or whatever. They didn't need to need to mm -hmm. try. Mm -hmm. And so at home, he, it would bother him. And, you know, uh, as an athlete myself, young, he would say, you know, Margo, like athletes compete no matter what they compete. Um, you know, you're, you're, whatever arena that is, you know, you got to compete to be your best. And so that's something that stuck with me. And then competition is so crucial to what we do. And, and a lot of people, sometimes competition can be crippling and it can be scary and, and, um, you know, pressure packed and all those things, but it's like finding a way to make 
competition celebrated and to enjoy that and thrive in that. And that's a that's the second thing I would say. And then elevating others is our third, you know, main pillar uh, and and elevating every single person. So when you come in a room, you know, how are you impacting others? Are you bringing them up? Uh, you know, are you bringing the energy to what you do, or are you um, you know, bringing that level down and, and being aware of that and, and trying to uh, elevate the best you can. Those are, those are the three things. Destro Swim Towers. Gain strength in the water with a tower of power. Save $150 per double swim tower by using code BRETT, B-R-E-T-T, -T, at checkout. DestroMachines.com. Vasa has been the go-to training tool outside of the pool for over 30 years. Vasa's products are ideal for developing power and proper technique in your swimmer's catch. Add a few Vasa trainers to your pool deck and it's like adding an extra lane to your swimming pool. Go to vasatrainer.com, use code BREAD at checkout and get 10% off anything from Vasa. In, it brought up a question kind of in terms of... Um, your energy because you're you're the head coach and you're going to see a lot of things that maybe you're going to see everything you know you know most people in your program are going to see parts of it and they're going to hear parts of it you're going to see and hear everything so what about you personally how, how do you deal with that like you you put your head on the pillow at night and you have to wake up and it's like you, you got a lot of you got a lot of stuff going on a lot of stress a lot of, a lot of you know, successes, a lot of failures, you know, it's, it's all happening. You see it all. So how, how do you deal with it? Yeah, it is a lot. It's a lot to, to work through every single day. And you, you said it like, you know, I'm at, at night, like when I go to sleep, I think, um, you know, I'm only fulfilled and feel good if, if I know that I did everything I, I could in that day and that I made, you know, that I, that I made some other people be better that day. And I mm. think uh, that's my staff, you know, that's making sure I'm, you know, telling them how grateful I am for them and how appreciative I am, uh, making sure they understand that, you know, I, I do, uh, you know, I, I see what they do and, and um, you know, and thank you for that. So like, say, like letting them know that. Mm. And that's not just the coaches, like that's my, you know, administrative secretary who's here every single day and she comes 30 minutes early when she doesn't have to, you know, there's, and telling her like, hey, that matters, you know, that's, thank you. Um, so making sure I'm being appreciative and grateful for them, that helps me uh, at night. And then also mm. this, the, the team, you know, I do tell them, I, I love this team. I love this team with, with everything that I am, I, you know, I, I want them to, to have the best experience. I want them to get the most out of this because um, college college athletics to me is is so special and something that for me, it it really just, I grew so much through that. And so I, I know what that's like and I, I want them to have that experience. You know, I came out of the, the University of Arizona and I said, I loved that. That was awesome. I'd want to do it again. And, uh, you know, I want them to have that. I don't want them to get to the end and say, oh, like I made it like, Oh, I finally like, whew, it's done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I want them to say like, wow, that was awesome. You know? Yeah. And so at night, if I know that I'm, you know, contributing to that bigger picture, then I feel good. But there's days when I, when I, you know, <laughs> there's a lot going on and, and, uh, and I wish I could be better and I try to be, but also giving myself, you know, being, being, uh, patient with myself and giving myself grace and, and understanding that things take time. Do you have someone on the outside of Alabama that you can talk to? I, I know that sometimes as the head coach of a major program, I felt kind of isolated. I felt like, you know, the whole world's against you because you're all competing against each other. So you can't talk to other head coaches necessarily. I don't know. That's kind of the way I felt sometimes where it was like, you know, everybody's, everybody's competing, everybody's against you. And so it was hard to kind of be honest and be open and just be genuine. Do you, do you have someone like that? Uh, yes. And I, and for, to your point, I've heard so many head coaches say that, and I think that is true. It's, um, it's a, it's a role that not a lot of people, uh, unless you've been in it, you, you, it's hard to explain or to understand or mm -hmm. to even know how that feels, but I do, mm -hmm. uh, agree with you a, a lot in that. And I go to Rick DeMott is someone who I swam for at Arizona and he, mm -hmm. he was a head coach, uh, 
you know, he's retired now and, and lives a very different life and is loving it. And so calling him and just getting a different perspective on things. And usually it's not really to like get an answer or to, for him to give me a solution necessarily. It's just to, for him to even just laugh at what I'm saying and just <laughs> say like, Oh man, like that, you know, I, I, uh, I'll tell you what I think. And, and, and so that stuff's helpful from, from that. So he kind of, mm. you know, he, he knows the sport, he gets the, he gets the athletic department side and, and different things like that. But then he's also, you know, retired. And so he can kind of look, look at things and also just laugh. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's, he's a big one. And then honestly, uh, my brother's a big one. He's, he's a doctor at the university of Michigan and he's dealing with life or death situations and things that um, are just very uh, heavy. And so when I call him about, you know, some stuff that is, you know, it's really, really important to me and it is important in the bigger picture, but to him, he's kind of like, uh, oh, you'll, you'll figure that out and it'll be okay. <laughs> and, um, so that's usually refreshing. And I, I do like talking to him about certain things. Yeah. Th there's no pro team in Alabama. So you've got, uh, the situation where you've really got two college teams and there's a lot of history between those two teams. And, um, some, sometimes there's a lot of pressure that comes with, beating that other team. So how do you feel about that team down the road? Uh, <laughs> you put me on the spot here. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, yeah, I mean, we want to be the best team in Alabama and the state. <laughs> and I do, I do think it's a fun, it's a fun rivalry. Uh, it's a fun, you know, Ryan and I are both, you know, new, new head coaches to, to the state. Um, and so we both take a lot of pride in what we do and, and, the school that we're at, of course, like any other coach, I would think. And, um, but I am looking forward to that, uh, rivalry. I am looking forward to competing with them every single year. And, um, I think in the same way that he's trying to build something there, you know, I'm, I'm wanting to create my thing here and it's happening at the same time. So it's kind of cool. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's really all I got on that. <laughs> Good, good. I like I like the way you kind of answered it and dodged it at the same time. So that's good. <laughs> um, what about alumni? I mean, what are the expectations from alumni? Have you heard from them? Do they do they, you know, they they put pressure or do they support? Uh, what's it been like for you initially with the alumni? Uh, alumni just want a team that they're that are they're proud of, right? They mm -hmm. want a team that uh, that they see good things are happening and, and that they're connected to it. So one thing I've tried to do since I started, uh, we do an alumni, alumni letter once a month and just keep them up to date on what's going on. We did get, have alumni uh, weekend this year. And so getting that rolling again, I think the pandemic set things back a lot with, with different events like that. And that is one thing uh, I do, I do want to, to continue strengthening is the alumni relations. I mean, Alabama's got a rich history. Uh, you know, Coach Gambrel, I I keep in touch and I I get with him once a month, which is great. And so staying connected with you know the 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 history of our program is really important to me. I have a lot of respect for for everything that's been done before I got here, and you know by no means uh, you know I, I walked into a situation that is honestly you know there was there were, they've they've paved the way for what we're doing. There's a lot of good here. And I want to tell them that as much as I can. And, um, you know, for them to come back to meets and to see what we're doing and to feel just proud of our program, that's what I want. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's, a, I've started that. And I think it's, um, it's moving in the right direction, but I do want to continue to strengthen that for sure. Well, listen, um, you know, we're coming to the end of this. I just, I just want to say congratulations. Look, I, I had doubts as, as anybody would if, of like somebody coming from, you know, professional athletes straight into a head coaching position and, and managing two teams. I mean, it's a monumental task and you absolutely knocked it out of the park. And I've, I've publicly said on, you know, certain platforms that you should be named coach of the year, SEC coach of the year, NCAA coach of the year, because, because of what you've done and how you've taken this team I mean, to finish fourth, I mean, you've got a trophy back there. The NCAA trophy is sitting behind you. It's, that is an outstanding performance in your first year. I mean, beyond what anybody could expect. And so I just want to say congratulations. You've done, you've done an incredible job at Alabama. 
Um, you're, you're now recognized as a formidable team in, in the NCAA. Any recruit would, would be stupid not to look at you and consider you and, and want to swim for you. So um, just congratulations. You've done an outstanding job. Thanks, Brett. It means a lot. Um, I think at the start of all this, obviously, you're going to have people that are in your corner and people who who aren't and people who believe in you and people who don't. And I think just like anything, um, you know, you you got to take that for what that is and then do whatever you want to do and just keep that simple. And um, that's what I've tried to do. And I told you before I even got on here, that was, you know, a big part of this season was I didn't want to do, you know, do too much outside of just my job, which was to to give everything I had to the program. So I am glad I got on here with you. I've, I mm. really enjoyed the the mm. talk. I told Roman, even after the podcast, I love to talk more like, you know, sprint training and different things like that. And obviously you're a brilliant mind in our sport and someone that I look up to a lot and um, pull a lot from. So thank you. I think this is a, this is a great, uh, a great podcast for our, for our sport as well. So thank you. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. And, and I'd love to, um, bring you back and maybe just pick your brain on sprinting more. I've kept, I've kept you for an hour and we've talked about kind of the program and, and bigger picture, but uh, definitely love to, to pick your brain more on, um, on the technical and the sprinting side of things, because look, you're, you're a, a fantastic athlete in your own right. And you've, you've got your own experiences and your, and your own successes. So, um, you know, definitely love to do that in the future, but listen, just congratulations on this. Um, thank you for doing this. Like I said, I've been, I've been hounding you for a long time, but I understand that, you know, respectfully you wanted to focus on the team and the performances and, and you got to respect that. That's pretty, pretty amazing. So congratulations again. Uh, good luck to you in the future. I hope, I hope you get many more recruits. Um, I hope they look at you. I hope they strongly consider you and your team because you're obviously doing fantastic things. So uh, congratulations again. Okay. Thanks, Brett. All right. Take care. Event heat lane name of swimmer times and places it's called swim nerd live and it allows the data and times from your actual scoreboard to be broadcast and viewed in real time on any smart tv phone or other device there are so many things you can do with this software a very simple and easy to use necessity for any team or facility that is live streaming their meets results one click on any device and they're watching your swim meet live in real time Go to swimpractice.com to learn more.